Dr. Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Uh, folks can watch um, a live stream on Yarma's uh, YouTube channel if so interested. So first item on the agenda tonight, as usual, is the public comment. If there's anyone who has joined the meeting, this will be the time to address the board. Thank you. I, I believe we have a couple uh, retail tobacco people that might want to say a few things uh, under the public comment right now that we could let them in. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, no, what's, what's the other one? Just have, have each person identify themselves, okay? Or who, who, the whoever's in the waiting room, just let them in. They can identify themselves, what their, issue, what what their comments are. By the way, I do see four of the, three of the board members besides myself. Is Charlie there? Yes, Charlie, Charlie is with us. Okay, I see that Deborah, Eric, and Mary are here. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Raj who is here with us who would like, um, I, I think he thought would like to speak. Yeah. Bruce, we have someone? Yes, Jason, you can unmute yourself uh, and you can mention any comments you would like. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, actually didn't prepare anything to say. I was more curious as to uh, what the board was, was thinking. Uh, um, what might be relevant, I know there's a discussion on the agenda of the tobacco cap. That's all I have listed here for tonight, which would be relevant to your interest, of course. That's fine. Um, I've asked Raj to um, unmute. Uh, Raj, if you want to unmute yourself, you could say something. Yeah. Good. No, I'm just yeah. I'm just I'm just waiting for that. Uh, the, what the board are going to decide? Okay, it's just for discussion tonight, so you can stay on and listen. And uh, the board will then determine uh, uh, which the next meeting that would go on. It might take a couple meetings to uh, discuss the uh, proposed changes, but thank you for tuning in. You're welcome. Okay. I, I believe the next person is Joe Gibbs. If you'd like to unmute and say something. Hi, just, uh, just listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else in the waiting room? No, uh, that takes care of all the people that wish to, uh, there's in the waiting room, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you everyone for showing up. That's good. Great. Uh, second item tonight is actually the discussion on the tobacco cap and what we have listed here on the agenda are two things. One is, uh, just a statement that the tobacco cap regulation was established in June of 2018. And the other thing here is the draft variance wording um, reference to the cap regulation. After the, I guess the discussion the last, at the last meeting, um, I guess some possible uh, editing uh, was going to be taking place or some people are gonna participate and perhaps submit, um, I guess some, some changes to, for discussion and possibly in the future to, to vote on. So I, I don't know if anything has been submitted. I didn't see anything in the package, but um, Bruce, what's up? That, that is correct. Uh, I have been in touch with uh, Deborah. Did reach out, and Erica have been and Eric have been working on a, um, a potential draft for discussion. Um, and I think if they, they could read it or give a little background on what your thoughts are. 
uh, I did print a copy for myself. Um, and I think I might have forwarded one to you, Mr. Chairman, this afternoon. But the uh, rest of the board has not got anything. So if I think if you give a little background on what's your thoughts and a uh, direction that you're thinking of. Thank you. Okay, Eric or Deborah? What? I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, Mr. Chairman. Um, so at the, at the last meeting I had, and I'm gonna need to go to my email, so I'm gonna lose you guys. So you can see me, but I can't see you. Um, so at the last meeting we had talked about um, perhaps uh, adding to or changing some of the language in the tobacco cap um, because I felt that we needed to have an avenue, uh, possibly have an avenue um, for businesses that had a more unique situation and that didn't necessarily fall within our our tobacco cap regulation. So I, what I did was I had looked at a number of different towns um, who had similar, had um, exact same ones with tweaks here and there. I believe we got ours from uh, a template off the MAHB. Am I right on that, Bruce? Hello? Bruce, you're... Yes, the, uh, the 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 regulation that we had. I'm sorry, Deborah. It was uh, okay. from the yes MHAB through the county regional tobacco that kind of had a model regulation for Cape Towns. Correct. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. So um, there was some language in one of the towns' um, tobacco cap that said in essence, and I'm just going to read it. Uh, the Board of Health reserves the right to revisit the cap from time to time depending on, but not limited to, changes in the town's composition, i.e. population, and or by application from an establishment that would provide benefits potentially outweighing public health concerns. Um, and then it says, in, in such case, the Board of Health will revise the regulations accordingly within the guidelines, MGL, but, you know, one of the, the uh, associated code and pertinent future leg le legislation. Um, so I thought that was a good addition to add an avenue for some sort of variance. Um, Eric and I had a conversation. We differed on, a, on, on some points. Um, and, but one of the things we did agree on is that um, there is a need for a tobacco cap and that perhaps um, adding some language that would say um, that we, we wouldn't want to go below a certain amount based on the town population um, so that there is an opportunity for new business to come in. Um, so what I sent to Bruce, what I proposed is that we cap the current permits at what they are currently at 29. And then if we do allow um, some sort of variance like language in the regulation, um, they, for them to come before the board again, um, and then we take a vote. And then what I think should happen, um, and people may disagree, but I also think if a permit expires, isn't renewed, or is revoked, it should go back to the town. And then the town should hold on to it for longer, longer than the 30 or 60 day period that, that uh, another retailer can sell it to another retailer. Um, and that um, there could be a waiting list. And if no one's on the waiting list or no one's applied for a permit during that year time, then the cap should be reduced by one. But that we should never go below um, like a one per 1,000 based on our population. So that there is, so if 10 permits went away tomorrow, um, and it would bring us to 19, we would stay at whatever, however many citizens we have, say it's, I don't know, 23,000, then we couldn't go below 23, if that makes sense. Eric, would you like to provide any conference comments? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think my um, thought process differs a little bit, but um, in my notes, um, the first thing that I 
included. Well, let me just preface this, I guess, by saying that um, I really don't have any objections to the current regulation per se, but my concerns more or less lie with um, the potential to have reoccurring instances of folks seeking tobacco sales permits and the board having a difficult time being in agreement um, based on what we saw over the past few meetings. So um, what I have here um, states that uh, this is our purpose statement, which is on the town's website. So the Yarmouth Board of Health purpose is um, concerned with all aspects of public health as they relate to daily living standards and is active with such issues as environmental standards, pollution control, land development, septic system standards, hazardous waste mitigation, and public health programs. So I, I guess, you know, everyone can interpret the purpose statement um, in their own light, but um, my thought is in accordance with the purpose statement, the board's primary concerns with land development should be those related to all aspects of public health as they relate to daily living standards, not necessarily those concerning economic development. So I do understand that that's a difficult subject and I do understand um, Deb and Charlie's concerns with, and everybody's concerns with um, bringing some much needed business to the town. But um, I also wanna state, and I know there's, I don't have an exact uh, citation for this, but I know that there's a lot of research out there and publications out there to prove this, but it is, this is, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing a quotation here. It is known that a higher density of tobacco retailers is associated with greater tobacco use. So to take that a step further, um, I see it as a mission of the Board of Health as related to tobacco sales should be to decrease the density of tobacco sales outlets in our community due to the direct link between density of tobacco retailers and tobacco use. So I did a fair amount of reading following the last meeting and um, I learned that several other, several cities use a um, ratio as Deb had mentioned, a ratio of tobacco retailers to population. And I was actually really surprised. Um, I'm gonna, and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong with these figures, but um, Yarmouth's current population is in the neighborhood of 23,000. And we currently have 29 sales permits. So if you divide one by 23,000, it, it's essentially a one to 800 ratio. So um, I know that some cities are setting a target of one to a thousand or even one to 2,500. So that's a significant difference from where we're currently at. We have one retailer for every 800 citizens. So, and again, I could be off a little bit with that math. Anyone can correct me. Um, so, as I said, I, I can understand the concerns with um, not closing the door on potential businesses. So having said that, um, I was considering the following, uh, not necessarily changing the cap, but potentially adding a clause to um, look at a target in our reduction efforts. So as it stands right now, a license that lapses is discontinued um, or retired. So um, what I was thinking we could potentially consider would be to um, keep the cap reduction in place as it stands right now, but potentially set a target ratio. And that would have to be agreed on by the board. Um, but let's just say 
that we agreed on um, one retailer for every 1,000 citizens. So what that would look like in Yarmouth, assuming our population doesn't change, would be 24 permits, assuming we stay at approximately 23,000 uh, residents. So um, if, if a target ratio were in place of let's say one to a thousand at that point when we achieve the target ratio then i would say um a license that lapses could be returned to the town and reissued according to um a wait list and um what a wait list to me would look like uh would be probably something that um, you would have to be in good standing with the town and you could not be, if you were a previous retailer who wishes to be on the wait list, you would have to have a, a clean record with no sales, no tobacco violations for a certain period of time, let's say two years. Um, and if you had previously had a license revoked, you would not be eligible to be a license holder again in town and um, potentially a small fee associated with maintaining, you know, a small annual fee of let's say $20 to be on the wait list. Um, so that's sort of what I was thinking uh, could be a potential revision. Um, and the, you know, we don't want to, close the door on prospective businesses and I and I understand that but I have legitimate I think legitimate concerns associated with um, looking at each case individually because if a if a prospective retailer comes in front of the board and is seeking licensure if we issue the permit to individual a and we choose not to issue it to individual B, I think that opens the door up for litigation. And I don't, I think this is a fairly complex issue. And one thing that's evident with the current regulation is it's, it's legally sound. So I think it just needs to be navigated very carefully because we don't wanna have legal uh, dilemmas <laughs> on our hands. So I'll, I'll close with that. Well, Deborah, Eric, thank you. Thanks for the effort. You're welcome. Um, so board members, some thoughts? Mary. Yeah, unmute. So, thank you, Deborah and Eric for giving that such serious thought. I, I really appreciate that. This is an issue I feel pretty passionate about and I apologize for not being at the last meeting to be able to speak up. Um, the intent of the policy um, is geared toward public health. Um, we have 24 whereases in the preamble to our policy. And the last one um, I'd like to read says, Whereas the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court has held that, quote, the right to engage in business must yield to the paramount right of government to protect the public health by any rational means, unquote. So um, as much as, you know, I like to look at the big picture and I like to think holistically, and I do believe that economic development um, impacts the town as a whole and all of the citizens in it. People have to have jobs, they have to have incomes so that they can provide shelter and, and food and, and just mental health um, for themselves and their families and, and the people that, that are around them. But I, I still, again, believe that our job is to protect the public health. Um, the, the purpose of the CAP was to reduce the density of tobacco retailers um, in a slow way. Um, and in some towns that's accomplished because the population is expanding. And so 
you know, that that just happens as as the town goes along. Our population is not expanding, basically. So I think that, you know, we we have an advanced cap, which means that we do retire licenses once they have expired or not been renewed. Um, and that's how we are decreasing the number of tobacco retail establishments. I, um, frankly, I think that our goal is to not have any. So I kind of differ with Eric in terms of saying, you know, the, with the ratio idea, because, you know, none are really the best to have zero per 1000 population. Um, because without the ability to advertise um, tobacco products anymore, you know, have signs and billboards and magazine ads and all, the establishments themselves are what is advertising tobacco use. And so the fewer we have, then the less tobacco use is out there, the less competition um, that's going to probably decrease prices that might then attract more young people or people without a lot of means to be able to purchase tobacco products. I mean, tobacco is just not, tobacco and smoke is not a good thing. We know this. Um, and now with uh, the coronavirus pandemic, we know that people um, who smoke are more vulnerable to COVID-19. That is one of now the comorbidities that younger people can have that would get them the opportunity to have the vaccine before the rest of the people in their age group otherwise. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a very bad um, substance. Um, and we've seen, you know, just in the few years um, that, that I've been on the board and that we've been looking at this issue, the whole thing with e-cigarettes, you know, we've done some educational efforts at the schools to try to um, get parents to have some more information about it. I mean, it just, it's, it's just a very insidious um, effort to uh, keep an industry going. And I think we don't want, I, I don't want any part in that um, myself. So my, um, my own belief is that we should keep the policy as it is Period. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, uh, I had Mr. one Schick. question. Uh, yeah, and that was trying to differentiate uh, between Deborah and Eric's approach to a bottom number. In other words, how are they different? I don't know, perhaps one of you could, or both of you, ex explain that, the difference. The difference in what, the... the How the, you're approaching it, in other words, so Eric? I'm approaching it in that I, I believe that there needs to be, especially in the times that we're in, with the economy being the way it is, that there is new business that wants to come into our town. And I feel like... Um, there should be an avenue for folks who want to bring business in this town to be able to possibly access a permit. Um, and I, I mean, that's my opinion. And I feel like I know we're talking, we should be talking about the overall health of our town and that's an economic, that's economic health, it's mental health. Um, it, it's all of those things. And I think that having, no tobacco in our town while uh, I mean I, I mean I think we all can agree that it's harm harmful and should be limited all the surrounding towns are going to be selling it and then bringing it into our town anyway and so I just feel like there needs to be an avenue for people who want a permit um, there should be 
and then that's obviously something that would need to be voted on. And I and I understand Eric's concern, and that's why I think town council would need to look at it so that it's it that we are bringing litigation upon ourselves. But I also think that we shouldn't. I mean, my personal goal isn't zero. Um, it is to reduce the cap, but it isn't to make it a zero cap. So, and that's to say that if, and I, and I know I've used this example before, but due to the economy, say 10 of our retailers go out of business in the current policy, then that means our tobacco cap would be 19. And if anybody wanted to come now, we've got 10 empty stores and that are set up to be convenience stores. And now nobody, now we've got empty stores and how long will those take to be developed? So, you know, I like, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think big picture and I'm trying to think about sort of what everyone's experiencing everywhere in terms of the economy. So that it concerns me that a policy we put in place may hurt small business in the long run. You were thinking of uh, coming up with a, a number, in other words. Yeah, so in other words, ultimately, I think there should be some sort of hardship, like I read that the town of Adams has, that somebody could come in front of us, give us their story, and then we could make a decision on whether or not we wanted to say yes or say no and make an exception. Um, obviously, it would be extreme cases, and, and I personally think um, that, the, that Jason, God love him, has come in front of the board four times now um, to just get an answer at this point. And I, and I think he, he, he deserves one so that he can sort of move on with his life and see if he can um, lease his property in another way. Um, so, and I, and I, so I believe that a lot of towns, like Eric was saying, they use um, a 25, uh, I'm sorry, uh, based on the population. So if you have 25,000 residents, then it's, you know, you'd have 25 permits. So it would be one per 1,000. Um, not every town does that. There's towns like Peabody that have a hundred permits and they don't have a cap and, um, you know, they just, I don't know, they just give them out. I don't know. Every town has, has different, um, tobacco caps and it all seems like they their templates from the MAHB. There's the, the mo most aggressive one, which is what we have. There's a medium one and there's sort of like a, you know, you call it tobacco cap light. Um, so yes, I believe that we should have a cap. I don't believe we should just open it up and have a hundred tobacco retailers, but I think there needs to be some, some avenue that we're not squashing small business just just during this particular economy. I don't know if that answered your question, Hillard. Yeah. Um, so I mean, do you have a lower number than? So oh, I think it should be based on population. Now, what right. I didn't really communicate, I think, was that our population increases significantly in the summertime. Um, so we, you know, we're not even putting that into the mix. So I, I don't know how many tourists and res, you know, summer residents that moved down and all of that. Um, I'm not even accounting for that. I'm accounting for the, you know, the one per 1000. So ultimately, I think that should be kind of the stop point. And then it shouldn't go lower than that. Just in case uh, somebody wants to bring a business into our town. And hey, if the population increases, great. You know, like Mary said, I, that would be an ideal situation, but unfortunately, we all know people are young people aren't moving here. Most of them are leaving. I um, may I speak, Mr. Chairman. Anytime. <laughs> I I'd, I'd like to go back to a, um, a comment that um, that Eric made, which. Um, I it spoke to me also, and that's that um, I'd like to have a policy that doesn't require us to keep revisiting it um, and re, uh, revalidating it or re, um, you know, supporting it. Um, and I, I think that that taking this approach to considering one by one appeals is can be very subjective 
And um, I, you know, I, I kind of felt the same way back when we were talking about the, um, the convenience store that uh, hadn't, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, I just, I, I can't remember, but, but it was a, an owner that was out of the country and, and, you know, they were, ought to, came in and talked about the 32 employees that would lose their jobs and, you know, that, <laughs> we're human beings, you know, we're, we're, we're on the board of health, but we care about people as a whole and that, that was a, a difficult situation for me and I think that we showed some very, nice compassion and, and consideration for them, but hopefully put a, a limit on it. I know that the motion I made say that if it happens again, their license is gone. Um, but I, you know, I would, I think it's fair to the people that are already in town. I did read the comments or hear the comments that the, um, the uh, I think two convenience store owners made at the hearing last time. Um, you know, we, we we've, said where are we, we have to hold the line we have to say this is what we believe this is what we're working toward and then just stick with it um i you know making money off of selling tobacco i i remember hillard um back before we set the the we did the whole regulation um Hillard's comment to some of the convenience store owners who came out on mass and and were you know very much against what we were doing, you know, said that some of them really need to rethink their business model, because the future is probably not in tobacco sales. Right now, it is. I mean, it's the biggest part of most convenience stores businesses. Um, so. I think the onus should be on people bringing business into the community to think about the health of the community also and what the public health people in the community are trying to, uh, trying to do. Mr. Chairman, um, Charlie would like to make a few comments to the board. Oh, great, sure. Yeah. To, to start with, I'd like to ask everybody on the board, how many of you people have ever been in business by your, for yourself? I have. You have, okay. You know, it's like to try and try and be in business. This town, I've looked at things for the last couple of years, uh, Route 28 looks like a desert zone in some places. I uh, really would like to see some businesses start up. And if somebody has a chance to start a business and bring something like the Kelly Block back to life and would like a tobacco permit is the only thing holding it up, I think that's kind of foolish. You know, as far as uh, people in this town, 25,000 people in this town, and we're trying to eliminate so many cigarettes to so many people, how many people haul the cigarettes out of the state of New Hampshire right now? Do any of you know? I can give you a rough idea. About 35% sure. of the cigarettes that end up in this town come from out of state. You cross the border, it's half price. You know, I've gone back and forth over the years up there working with law enforcement and I've seen some of these stores and how they sell cigarettes. You know, we may be able to slow it down but we're never going to stop it. And people are going to smoke no matter what we do. You know, there's, we're not going to change the world by a tobacco regulation. We can educate people and hope they learn. And that's as far as we can go. But as far as thinking that we're going to stop the world from smoking cigarettes, get it out of your head. It ain't going to happen. And if that, like I said, if that's a lousy permit, tobacco permit is stopping somebody from starting up a business in this town and paying their taxes and living here, you know, I, I think we ought to give that a thought. You know, I, I'm all for health, but I'm also, you know, somehow this 
there's got to be a survival pattern here somewhere. People are trying to, to make a living. And if that's the only thing standing in the way, I think it's crazy. So, enough of me. You know, over the years, I'm sure you've heard it over and over again, is that I think it's important, at least for me, and I think for the whole board, that we treat everyone equally uh, when we make decisions here. Uh, and this is an example where it will be quite difficult to do that. When, um, you know, uh, we think of variances, we think of septic systems. Um, and what usually happens is there aren't any choices. In other words, it's the, uh, the property that just only allows certain systems from being built. Um, we're not, it doesn't go further than that. Usually, uh, unless someone has a closed tank, which is some, sometimes an option, a pretty awful one, but we grant variances when there aren't any alternatives. That's what those variances are. Um, so this is, is quite different of having to make uh, decisions based upon pr people presenting uh, their particular case or, or the issues they have with their business. Um, so I certainly need to hear more from the board of how we're going to treat everyone equally. Uh, I, I mean, I think we owe that to the community. I'm not sure how to, to pick and choose who we would grant a license to, a license which is worth over $100,000 right now from what we've heard to people, in fact, quite a bit more. Um, if we grant it to someone, they can sell it also. So there's a market for those. And that makes it a little bit more complicated, I think. It's unfortunate that um, this this notion that you know having a, a tobacco sales permit is the catalyst for a successful business and I, I and I understand that it probably is for having a successful convenience store I can't argue with that we've seen the income that's generated by the tobacco sales in those stores but there are other possibilities for for business ventures so I mean I I understand Charlie's concern I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not in business for myself. I have worked for several small businesses locally, none of which are involved in tobacco sales, but I, I guess I sort of have a hard time understanding that, you know, that that's the only successful business enterprise in some of these locations though. And, and Mary, I have to say, I, I actually agree with you that you know, to put a to put a number, you know, of a of a ratio of citizens to sales permits, zero would be the ideal number in terms of our per, how our purpose is concerned. Um, I guess my only uh, attempt was, I don't want this to be a reoccurring issue where the board has to rehash this and reopen this every time that somebody wishes to to obtain a sales permit and, you know, because that's not, as and Devin mentioned, it's not fair to, to give anybody false hope. I mean, I think in this case, we're, we're giving everything fair consideration. And I'm, I'm sure that was done in 2018. It happened to be before my time on the board. So I'm thankful I've had the opportunity to be involved in this and research it because it's a complex issue, but I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that if we look at every situation individually as if it were a septic variance, I, I just think that could be a heck of a nightmare. I just don't see how, I, I just don't think it's fair. I mean, that's, I think, I think the only way to be fair is to have a blanket approach. Um, 
you know, there are two people who have been who want a new license, right? They come in front of the board. These are people who it would be new licenses. They haven't had licenses before. They own uh, buildings, real estate, uh, where the owner of those businesses uh, did have a license at one point. Uh, that's what those two have in common. So essentially they're looking for a new license. Um, and the question is, you know, how do we address, for instance, other people who would want a license or how do we handle uh, other stores that at one point, five years ago, had a license. Um, and they know they're available now. Um, how, do, how do we look upon those individuals? Once again, it, it goes back to, it would have to be, a, it's gotta be fair. And that's assuming we would maintain the cap or increase it, but not lower it. So it, it's, each scenario is going to be very different. You know, the, the, the two people who are waiting now, um, you know, we certainly need to give them an answer one way or another. Um, and that right now, um, that's something that, they, you know, their businesses being their real estate was an issue quite some time ago. Um, however, there are probably other businesses that could say the same thing. That's all. And I'm not sure how we would differentiate one from another. Uh, each one's going to be unique. The two we have, one of them, uh, the holder of the license decided not to sell the license to the owner of the building. And the other one, uh, the business wasn't uh, watched very carefully, I guess. Um, and the license was, was, was taken only because of some very illegal activity. Um, so it's an example of two very different scenarios. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to uh, finalize uh, Deborah's uh, draft? Uh, and then we could put that on the next Board of Health meeting to uh, uh, look at it, discuss it. Maybe we uh, could meet with town council before then. Um, you know, what's the, the pleasure of the board? Um, there are other towns on the Cape that have a cap that we could look at also. So uh, whatever the board wishes, I could move forward. Well, would some of that need to, well, Eric, I'm, I guess I'm really looking towards you in sense of um, what, how are, would your thoughts affect that, what, what Deborah's proposing? In other words, are you in favor of making a change of the regulation? Uh, and if so, if so, you would need to be part of, part of that process. Um, well, I, I think Deb and I um, disagree on a few sort of key components. Like, for example, and Deb, please feel free to interject here. No, I will. But I, as I understand it, Deb wants to look at each case individually. <laughs> um, my efforts in drafting my uh, proposal were sort of stemmed from the idea of finding a, a happy medium that treats everybody the same. In other words, um, you know, each case would not be visited individually with my proposal. It would, it would, everybody would go on a wait list. And once a certain ratio was achieved, whatever the board saw fit, at that point, when that ratio was achieved, we could stop uh, retiring those licenses that would have otherwise, um, we would stop retiring licenses if they were failed to be renewed. Um, or if we revoked a license, it wouldn't be 
um, discontinued. Only, only once whatever ratio the board agreed upon was achieved. So, um, I mean, if it's if it's up to me, I, I I'm inclined to probably take no action. But um, if I, I guess if they're I don't know. I guess if if there was a if we were really if collectively we were really concerned about closing the door on businesses, this is just the only way that I was able to to see a um, you know a viable approach, a, a fair approach towards um, towards uh, allowing businesses to, to be able to obtain licenses at some point. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, I mean, Eric, would you feel comfortable just, we'd be looking at Deborah's then at this point? And that well, would... honestly, if I can interrupt just for a second, I mean, Eric yeah. and I spoke about um, both of our proposals. Eric's not on board with it. And I'm, I'm, fairly certain bringing it in front of the board would be a waste of time. Well, no, I, what my concern was, was that if both of you want to change the regulation, then both we should look at, discuss, and then vote on, on those uh, proposed regulations. I just, um, Director Murphy mentioned yours. I just want to make sure did Eric want us to look at, at his? That's that's all I was asking. Okay, I misunderstood. Yeah. Or, um, I, I mean, I'm I'd be happy to draft it and have the board take a look at it, but I, I mean, I get, I get. Excuse the, me, Eric. That's only if you want the regulation change. Otherwise, you would not need to do that. We we we'd have one to look at. That would be Denver's, unless you want to edit and change the regulation, which is fine. I, I'm if I'm inclined to probably to take no action, but as I said, I just I do have concerns that, you know, I don't I don't want this to be a reoccurring issue of of um, the I don't want the board to be in disagreement every time. I mean, and maybe maybe that's OK. Maybe that's the way that these boards work. I'm just, been a board member for two years so uh if that's the way that these things go then that's the way they go and um maybe that's fine i'd like to hear from everybody so i'm i'm here to learn and you know we all are <laughs> yeah. i i want to hear dissenting viewpoints i want to hear other people's input absolutely um charlie um do you want to write a proposed regulation also? So there'd be two to uh, discuss and possibly vote on. Do we have an answer from Charlie? Oh, sure. Char Charlie's right here. He, he, he. Go ahead. Just tell him you'd have a proposal. I have a proposal no, for the cap. You could consider that. Yeah, I could consider a proposal for the cap. But, uh, no cap. I could consider a proposal for no cap. You know, what uh, I'm asking is. Um, all I can tell you is somehow this board. <laughs> has to find some way to be flexible with business. I okay. understand that we're a board of health, but we're supposed to have a brain. And you know, if we close up every access for cigarettes, because we think we're doing a good thing, we're going to bury the town. This is... People are trying to start businesses in this town and that, geez, I really would appreciate it if we could help them a little. Instead of telling them, no, this is cut and dry. We've got to have some kind of flexibility with people who are trying to exist. Well, 
Okay, Charlie? Yeah. Okay, Deborah, you know, put some effort and time as well as Eric and the, uh, as Bruce mentioned, um, we could look at, you know, uh, the language in Deborah's regulation um, and move forward to the next meeting with the following one. This is an opportunity, you, feel, you sound very, you know, in favor of uh, approaching this in a particular way. This would be an opportunity if you wanted to write or edit our current regulation. I'm asking, do you want to do that? We would then be looking at two different versions of changing the regulation. Are you interested in doing that? This would be the opportunity to do that. You're just saying remove the cap section from the regulation. That's easy. Yeah, well, remove the cap. You know, do something. We've got to be flexible. That's the only thing I can think of. Bruce, maybe you can show Charlie my proposal and see if it's sort of in line with what he's thinking. Okay, um, this is not going anywhere. So Deborah, we'll, why, why don't you, you know, work with Bruce and certainly you can contact me anytime. And um, we'll see what the language is and decide what to do. Is that okay with you, Deborah? Yes. Good, good, okay. So, so we'll all get to see it before the next meeting? Um, yes. The answer is yes. The question is, when, when do you want this to take place? When, how much time? Because I, I think the people that are in the wings waiting, you know, we're really, we're not being fair to them by dragging this out. So I'd, I'd like to really get going on this. I, I, I agree with you. Um, we, we certainly owe it to, to them, those are two people. If um, there are people who may want also to ask for a license to be granted, okay? So just keep that in mind for the following meeting, we may have 15 people who would like a license. From a business standpoint of view, that may be in their best interest, for sure, they're very valuable. So I think the board needs to consider that. Think about it if that's what takes place. Um, so, um, Director Murphy, when do you think we should uh, ad address the regulations? Uh, the board's next meeting uh, would be in two weeks, which would be um, April 19th. Okay. Uh, and the, the uh, packet information goes out on Thursday, so we would need to have something in by Wednesday uh, of a draft so we could put that out. And I can, work, I can work with Charlie on his thoughts on uh, removing the cap wording. Fine. That's, that's great. Mary, you mentioned and entering the two parties who are interested in finding out uh, about their properties and so on. It's something we can vote on independently. We could do that if we want to tonight, or if, if you think we should just wait until uh, we vote on changing regulations. Once again, this will be done. It's a retroactive, uh, I guess, change on policy it would be looking for people in the past that's all but we could certainly if the board wants to vote on that two people and and two cases whether you want to vote on it tonight hello could you clarify what would we be voting on whether we're going to grant licenses to these individual people one was at uh, the former 7-eleven location the other was at the great island um, so those are two people who are seeking new licenses. If I understand this correctly, that we could make a decision if we wanted tonight, um, which is independent, it would be just based upon our current regulation, right. or we could just wait until we uh, address this later on. I guess I don't understand how we can vote to give them permits when we're saying that there's currently a cap and there are no permits. I, I'm not sure I, I understand we, what we would be voting on. Whether to grant it or not. I mean, people can ask for it. Doesn't I mean, you take a vote. I, I don't think it makes any sense, but that's just one person here. Uh, I don't think it makes any sense either. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just that they've been waiting, Mary mentioned it, that they're waiting yeah. a long time and I agree with her. Yeah. Okay. So, sounds like we will not act upon that. Then. 
Um, anything else before we move on in the agenda? If not, let's go to item number three. It's the update on the coronavirus. Uh, Director Murphy, you're on. Just need to unmute yourself. Yes, board members. Uh, as you see, we have the uh, in information uh, chart of daily active cases uh, as of um, last Friday. You can see that uh, we are really in that third wave uh, that started uh, in March and is continuing uh, at one time. And we're still close to uh, uh, 90 to 100 active cases per day. So I think it's pretty clear uh, we can see the map. Based on the bottom and everything. Does it go all the way to the side? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, we'll go to the next uh, slide. Um, these are kind of the same format that uh, we've been using, uh, board members and public at home, that as of last Friday, the overall cases from when we uh, had our first case last March 11th, we're at 1,383. And on Friday, we were falling 87 active cases. Uh, we're still remaining at 31 deaths overall. Uh, by village, um, West Yarmouth, South Yarmouth, fairly close. And as I mentioned, based on population, less on the, uh, the north side at 240, but it is community spread. Thank you. Um, and uh, by, age, by age group, we can still see right now, uh, it's a little bit higher in that age group, 50 uh, through 59. Uh, however, it's very close between tw uh, 20 to 40. So, um, and then 40 to 49 is also very close. So you can see it's community spread and pretty much through the uh, age groups of uh, 20 through uh, 69. So it's... Um, uh, fairly well spread. Thank you. That's also the the three decades of age that does seem to be increasing, right? That's true, and it's also the age that have uh, uh, it's the working population. It's also the age that have uh, families in school that were seeing cases brought into the school uh, from these cases. So uh, what we're seeing is uh, uh, it's it's most of the cases are coming from households, uh, not people picking it up and. Uh, necessary stores or uh, places like that is spreading from the households. Okay, the uh, the next shot. Go ahead, keep going. I wasn't. Uh, this shot was not updated uh, as of Monday or Friday. We usually gets updated. Uh, we pull this shot from the uh, county uh, human services that puts it when it comes out on Friday all the uh, positivity rates on the Cape. Uh, they're gonna cut back instead of doing it every five days to possibly twice a week. So uh, we're gonna have to probably change how this presentation goes, but we can still see that uh, Bonstable and Yarmouth still remains the two highest positivity rates uh, on the Cape um, out of the seven towns that are red high risk groups. Bonstable did go down to 9.63. And Yamath went down pretty much it stayed the same, I would say, 11 level of 7.7, 7.8. So uh, the other towns are, are still in the red. And you can see uh, a sandwich went uh, up to seven. So uh, they're seeing more cases right there. So we're going to be looking at how we re reproduce this chart in the future. It's, Bruce, it, it's not just uh, Yamath and Marshall being the highest on the Cape. It, it's, it's statewide. Uh, Correct. It's the highest positivity rates in the whole state. So based on the highest positivity rates and uh, the new P1 variant now being found in Massachusetts, you can go, uh, you know, that's kind of making it um, a lot more uh, as the epicenter. We can see the third wave is now starting on the Cape. We're seeing more of the, uh, the P1 variants on the Cape along with the UK variant. So there's a lot of uh, uh, continued spread on the Cape with both variants uh, 
spreading at a, at a quicker rate uh, than the uh, the regular COVID. Uh, so because almost all of the P variant cases in the mid case for the entire state. Yes, there's, there's 57 uh, cases of the um, P1 variant within the Massachusetts. 38 of them are on in Bonsville County. And if you look at uh, the high two high positivities between Bonsville and Yarmouth, uh, we have a majority of those cases. And if you look at the, basically the Mid Cape area, um, it's about 36 of the 38 cases are within the Mid Cape area and, and, Bruce, spread, and spreading out. Bruce, I have a question that the article that I sent out from the Globe that talks about what you're talking about right now said that there was a cluster. So what, what, where is the cluster? Uh, most of the cases are in Yarmouth. Where is the cluster? The, uh, I, I don't think the word cluster was probably the correct uh, term they should have used in the newspaper because a cluster, you would think that was at one location and it's really community spread. It's not at one particular business or area. The cluster would be with, considered the whole town. Well, okay, because a cluster would be, you know, at, at one source, and that was how the, and you're saying that's not the case. Correct. We're seeing it spread at, within different individuals, uh, not coming from one household or, or one or one. Or church group mm -hmm. or school or, okay. Well, we are getting uh, uh, one church that, that is showing uh, an increase in cases. So there's a cluster there. Yes. That How many cases? Work. How many cases? Uh, that I don't have that number right now for you. Okay, but, but it's, it's, a, it's in Yarm. No. No, okay, Barnstable. No. Okay. Yes. Thank so, you. Yes, welcome. So on the uh, hospitalizations, uh, you can see April 1st, um, the last Thursday, Cape Cod Hospital uh, had 26 people uh, in a uh, hospital with four in the ICU. So um, that's uh, increasing and in something that we're monitoring uh, with the hospital. Uh, thank you. Um, it's uh, COVID. Some people are staying with them a lot longer. I know we do show this from time to time. And just to let people know that uh, they're looking at um, people that they might have uh, don't have the symptoms, but it's taking them a lot longer to recover. Um, like it says, some people have mild symptoms uh, uh, and then they, after 14 days, they seem to resolve, but it seems that it could be 10% uh, of the people that do get COVID could go into uh, ongoing symptoms, uh, which they're now calling the long haulers. So, uh, and, and just, there's, and there's some anecdotal information that people who have had COVID that um, now are vaccinated are seeing some improvement. Yes, yes, okay. Um, we're still saying at the 31 deaths, uh, we haven't had anything since February. So that's, the, that's very good. And we do work closely uh, with that information, obtaining it from the town clerk and uh, as reported uh, to the town clerk from whether it's Cape Cod Hospital or the nursing homes. I uh, just put that in, reminding people wear a mask and, and avoid social gatherings. Okay. On that note, uh, I can just tell you when I go to the landfill, uh, about half the, half the residents are wearing masks. That's where we're at at this point. And that's after a full year. Uh, one of the concerns I have is people are perhaps after they're vaccinated, will be less likely to put a mask on. And yes, and the, the signs had uh, somehow were taken down at the landfill and they have been uh, put back up. And those signs are, are better, better signs actually, uh, just the way they were designed, they're legible, the letters are straight. I uh, just make reference to the Board of Health as well. So thank you for getting it done. Thank you. Um, this is just a breakdown of the uh, 31 deaths that we had uh, by age group. Uh, obviously the uh, higher age had the uh, 
higher higher grouping percent. Thank you. Uh, and then breaking down the deaths by gender, um, fa fairly close to 50-50. Okay. Um, news article from last, uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, the Sunday, March 28th, uh, which I had stated that um, with the COVID variant cases present on the Cape, um, still a concern to take the proper steps. Uh, I'm trying to make it out to the uh, paper that we need more vaccine to get ahead of the surge on the Cape. Uh, and this was a, uh, an article stating that. Um, this article uh, the next day uh, was in the Boston Globe, surge of vaccine could fight the spike. Uh, again, the need to get vaccine to get out ahead of the, uh, what I'm saying is the third wave and the request for the governor to send more vaccination to the, uh, the hospitals on the Cape and our large vaccination site at the community college. Well, Bruce, that hasn't really taken place, right? Uh, it's it, it, it recently, I would say within the last, uh, well, last couple of days, I've been informed that the case, the number of vaccine has increased to Cape Cod uh, Hospital and the college has received uh, more than their 750 doses uh, that they might be getting up to, um, and they don't know if it's a one-time bump or not, but they might be getting up to 3,000 doses. Okay, so, that's big, big news. That was not happening. I mean, we've been on the yeah. conference calls several times a week for, for the whole yes. year. And that's and just recently. recently they weren't, the state wasn't giving us their their strategy for us to understand why they weren't diverting vaccine here right. when we're the epicenter at this point. So right. I'm happy to hear they're sending vaccine now. Yeah, so uh, that was good news, good news that I heard over the last uh, day. And uh, uh, hopefully that the, uh, the governor's understanding that uh, we need more vaccine and maybe the uh, uh, press releases and, and media releases is... Uh, um, allowing us to get more vaccine on, on the Cape. He's probably tired of hearing from Bruce Mur Murphy in Yarmouth. <laughs> yes, asking for vaccine. So um, I thought it was a good article. This just goes more into that article in the Globe, but I thought it was very good. Where they also referenced uh, some of the Boston uh, professors uh, saying what, what, what was needed also. So I thought that was very good. And then when they had in the uh, Cape Cod Times around New England, what, what uh, various states were doing, Connecticut, Maine, Rhode Island, just scroll down just a little bit. When they came to uh, Massachusetts, it said that uh, there is an increase on the Cape and uh, 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 health agent uh, director was looking for more vaccine on the Cape. So I'm sure that caught a lot of people's attention uh, in the Boston area that when we made the uh, what's happening in New England. We're seeing local businesses still take uh, precautions. We have the uh, couple of Cape Cod banks and other banks looking at uh, closing their lobbies and just having drive up. So I think you see uh, businesses still taking precautions. We're uh, still doing testing. We did testing uh, two Sundays in a row at the Melody Tent area. Um, and we're still getting the uh, test results back. But my position now has been now that we've tested uh, two areas at the Melody Tent, we've tested our schools over three days. Uh, we know we're picking up still cases. The answer is to have vaccine available for people that wish to get it. And hopefully with this increase, that will be helpful. Um, COVID precautions. I know I have, I keep saying this and, and it, you know, people still need to be listening because we're still getting COVID cases come in through our tracing um, dinner parties that we have to be careful with to make sure everybody in your dinner party group has been vaccinated because you can carry that in. Uh, birthday parties, we're still having uh, cases at birthday parties. Sleepovers, we're still having sleepovers that we do not need to have. Uh, uh, we just had one come in today from a bachelor's party that uh, several people became positive and then brought that back. And now the people in that house are, are positive and that reached out to uh, one of our school children. So um, 
it's just uh, we just need to keep saying uh, it's spreading and it's spreading out there and we need to keep telling people uh, this, the uh, social distance. Okay. Uh, continuing precautions that we did uh, talk to the Board of Selectmen uh, that during this particular time of increased uh, the third wave is the uh, not be doing the cabanas at this time. Uh, they're not going to start renting them. Uh, they were going to stop anyway in uh, Memorial Day, but we said we'd look at it again in uh, May that maybe we decrease the numbers, but maybe we could look at um, uh, doing a lesser number at the cabanas because we do want to see people outside. Hopefully in the next month as we see more people vaccinated that we'll be able to get people outside and using the flax pond area and cabanas. Um, the uh, disposal stickers uh, seem to have been going okay that we do April 1st. We didn't have the big backlog like last year. We had to bring in the trailer. So hopefully the, uh, the uh, stickers are still moving okay. I know they do get a rush down at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So I know they're concerned down there, but hopefully we're, we're moving past and getting the stickers out. Um, beach parking lots will be still working closely with the rec and D DPW on again on that. Um, obviously still a concern with the basketball courts. Uh, when we drive back through there, we can see 20 or 30 kids. Um, that's school age kids. That's obviously a concern with the playground. Um, and using the soccer fields for a pickup on weekends uh, is a concern that we have to monitor very closely. Um, discussion points, we can keep going right down. Um, we did open up the recreation office. That was a, a couple of weeks ago. I just wanted to mention that. Um, pickleball's up and going. Um, the rec director has talked to the pickleball um, staff director up there to make sure we're um, taking the precautions. Children's library is on pause right now before they can do children's time. They did have this weekend a book reading outdoors where they just set up signs and you could kind of walk through a labor and follow the 20 something pages of the book, which was pretty interesting at the uh, West Yarmouth Library. Okay. So as we move into vaccine, uh, the governor keeps pushing that out. And, you know, as of um, today, el people, you can go. People were eligible down to 55 with one health condition now is eligible today. So obviously more people are, are getting the vaccine, uh, hopefully at the uh, larger sites off Cape, but uh, with the increase on Cape and at the hospital, I think that will help on the Cape. And then later uh, in April on 19th, it opens up to pretty much everybody 16 and above. So we just need to get the vaccine uh, out here. Um, just some interesting statistics from um, the state as of March 31st of what we're looking at uh, of people vaccinated in town. And I, I think the people with at least one dose is um, important. Um, maybe scroll up, I got the wording, there we go. Um, so, you know, we've got 10,000 people with, with one dose in town. I think that's great. Um, but when we look at the number of doses that we still need to provide uh, in the different areas of population of the 65 and, and now dropping to 55, uh, we hope to can continue e de increasing that. Um, it's just a ways to go in our elderly population that we still need to reach out to. Vaccination plans, like I said, where the, where the county was just getting 975 doses, they kind of moved it up to 1,500 the last couple of weeks, and then uh, a new bump the last week and this week. So hopefully the uh, request for vaccine that the hospitals, the counties have been asking for, and myself for vaccination is freeing up some more additional vaccine down here. Uh, we do have the one large site at the community college as vaccines increase, whether we see that in the next couple of weeks where they can do smaller sub-regional clinics like we had before, either at the uh, county fairgrounds or down Cape further to Orleans DPW for people that wish it would be helpful. 
CVS is uh, very active on Station F uh, um, on providing shots along with Stop and Shop and Hyannis and Howwich. Our vaccination plans are obviously dependent on um, vaccine. Uh, we're, we're hoping to start with our homebound uh, next week, working with community health care, uh, uh, healthcare, but working directly with community uh, out of Cape healthcare. Okay. Uh, vaccination team is the uh, ha Harbor Community Health in Hyannis, and then Outer Cape Community Health will be helping us with our homebound, and we're hoping to be able to provide Johnson and Johnson, uh, and we'll finalize that by this week. And when we do, we'll be working with the Council on Aging to make uh, calls of approximately 160 people that we need to vaccinate a homebound. The vaccination team is obviously the health department through coordination. Council on the age, Aging that has uh, maintained a list and we'll be making the phone calls. Police department and fire department, EMS, paramedics that will be going out uh, and probably a teams of uh, uh, two to three on a team and they'll probably fire department will probably have three or four teams and it'll probably take three or four days to get to our, all our homebound. Bruce, I have a question. Yes. Um, the homebound, is that going to include people in assisted care or memory care units that um, have not had the opportunity to have the vaccine? The people that in the memory care that associated with a, uh, a nursing home, uh, as I understand, have most of them have received it. We've had one but, or two but, reach out to us that we'll, we'll try to work with if needed. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah. The, the uh, both nursing homes we have in town are, are I wanna say 100% uh, vaccinated. Uh, we did have uh, uh, a concern that they needed to get vaccination for new people coming in, that right. they were able to get some, or people that left that needed their second, that needed their second dose. So uh, that worked out, we did call the state. Uh, they also called the state, so uh, that worked out well. Again, we're continuing to work with the Meals on Wheels. People get Meals on Wheels to stay in contact. And uh, as I've said, I've reached out to the local churches. So we're, we got a good feel of what we th think is homebound or, or people that need it. And we'll continue working on that list. People that are watching at home can call the Council on Aging uh, and they're still maintaining a list. If they're not homebound, still call the Council on Aging if you need assistance because we are passing along the list to Cape Cod Hospital. Um, Council on Aging passed on a list of approximately 4,000 names three weeks ago to the hospital if they people needed uh, appointments. Um, besides trying to get on to the uh, vaccination site, which can be a challenge. And from my talking to the Cape Cod Hospital uh, outreach today, they have already gone through the called the 4,000 names over the last three weeks. And they've also called it twice. Uh, some people have already had their shots. Uh, some people are just waiting for a second shot. Uh, obviously, some people didn't answer, so they're working their way uh, through it twice, and they're going to start working their third way through it. And we still provide new names as people call in to the Council on Aging. We'll still provide, provide them over to uh, Cape Cod Healthcare. That's great. Um, County uh, Helpline is still uh, offering assistance and that's been very helpful, I understand, with some people. So um, that, that number of the helpline is, is still available also. So I just put that in. I'm still out there talking to the public. As soon as the, the, uh, the news media, as soon as something gets in the Cape Cod Times, it's picked up by all the news media off Cape. And I give them my same... Um, speech that uh, yes, we're in the uh, third wave down here. We have the two high variants and uh, more vaccine is, is needed on the Cape. Good. So whether it's, uh, that was, this was in front of, this was Fox News in front of the uh, town hall when I was showing them the, uh, the map showing the, the third wave that uh, the news media has, uh, I think been very helpful uh, pushing it within Massachusetts. Uh, and especially with the new third wave uh, increasing uh, on the Cape. And you even see the number of red towns that are high risk have increased from uh, uh, almost uh, 
exponentially the last three weeks. Okay. I think we're kind of winding down, just uh, going over the, uh, the chart, pointing that out. And uh, this is my last shot that we did end up showing this shot in a uh, um, Cape Cod Times newspaper. So people could understand where this, this is coming from. So that ends my uh, presentation on the update of uh, um, coronavirus update, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. A lot of work, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the board? Um, yeah, so, well, comment and question. Um, signed up for my vaccine tomorrow at the community college. So thank you for all your hard work, Bruce, getting more vaccines here. Um, my question with regards to a second, I'm, I'll be getting the Pfizer vaccine. So I know a second dose is required. I've heard from some individuals that at their appointment for their first shot, they scheduled their appointment for their second administration. Is that true across the board? No, no. Some, okay. some are getting their second shot uh, notification when they sign up. Others are, are uh, because the state is getting as much vaccine out there as they can. What they'll do is call you a week before your second shot is due and tell you that you're, um, you're scheduled. Um, so that, that's difficult because a lot, not everybody's waiting the two weeks. They, they get nervous and they're calling the health department or emailing us or reaching out this council on aging. So, but everybody, they will be notifying a week before their second shot is due. So in other words, I, I won't need to, to enter a waiting room or anything again to sign up for a second dose. Correct. Okay. Great. One was a comment. One was a question. You said. Uh, my first comment was just that I'm getting my vaccine and I okay. partially I'm crediting Bruce for his hard work. <laughs> I okay. attribute Thank it you. to him. <laughs> and, and the Cape has the highest vaccination rate after what is it Nantucket, I guess, in the mm -hmm. state. So, um, you know, maybe that's part of the reason that the state has not been very forthcoming sending more vaccine. Correct. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, number four here. Five. Okay. Here we go. Number five is discussion wastewater committee, and that specifically was about a board of health representative on that committee. Um, I had uh, asked Bruce for the specifics on it, and. He got back to me and it generally meets on Mondays at 4 p.m. and generally it's around once a month is my understanding. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question goes back, uh, Charlie, do you intend to attend the meetings? Okay, what's going on? Well, um, if, if you recall, there were several um, committees that needed representatives on. Um, one was the WISAC, and that was the youth substance abuse that I had done for several years, and Eric uh, volunteered to be on that now. And the other was the wastewater committee that you agreed to, to be on. Um, and some questions whether or not you were attending or not. You want to continue? Or? I don't mind continuing as long as I can get in the door. You know, I, I, they asked me to come to a meeting and then lock the door. It doesn't doesn't help. But I don't think they're all here, though. I think some of them are at home now. They don't come in. Well, then, then they... No one's, coming in. no one's coming in from the meeting. Oh, nobody's coming in from the meeting, then I can't help you. Well, hold on. Are these meetings 100% done remotely? Yes. Yes. Uh, 
So the answer to the question is you're, you'll not be participating. Right. He said he would. Meetings. Yes, Charlie said he would uh, defer it to another member because they're 100 percent remote now and he's not set up for it. OK, so do any of the meetings um, conflict with the Board of Health? I mean, are they usually like an hour so it wouldn't be a problem? I don't know. I haven't. I, yeah, I did ask the DPW director of that which nights, because I did say we had board of health meetings at first and third Mondays at five. So um, we'll need to have that. That answer hadn't come back yet. Well, I'm I'm willing to um, volunteer to go ahead and um, sit in until the meetings become live again. Okay. Thank you. That, that's great. Uh, I'm sure we all, we all appreciate that, okay? Um, and if there's some reason a particular meeting night, you cannot just re reach out to the board and see if one of us, you know, can sit in, okay? So will somebody get in touch with me with the schedule and all? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, yes. I'll forward your, your information over to uh, the wastewater committee. Okay, thank and you. And I'll, I'll send you a, uh, uh, um, um, who's on the meeting, the, the uh, members. Okay. And I believe there's a update to the Board of Selectmen on March 30th about the wastewater. Um, that's something we can all check in on uh, and listen. <laughs> so, okay, that's done. Uh, we're on to new and old business. Director Murphy, anything you want to bring up? Nope, I think, I think we're all set. I think we covered all the points. Okay. Board members, new old. Um, I actually was wondering how it, we would could go about possibly making our meetings uh, later, possibly starting them at six. I, I don't really know what the process is and, or how that works. I just know the five five o'clock is getting increasingly difficult for me to be on time for. So um, I don't know what everyone else has going on, but. I, I was wondering if perhaps we could either push it a half hour or even just make it at six. Well, board members, I mean, part of it starts certainly with, um, with Bruce right now. You're the one who's going in and in the office and not at home. So that's, a lot of that falls upon you. Nope, that's fine. Whatever the uh, time frame the board wishes to meet is fine with me. Mary, you can stay at the wastewater meetings longer. Oh, oh, great. Oh, yay. <laughs> yes. I, I have no problem meeting later. Okay. Eric, Charlie? Um, I would say, I mean, 5.30 is better than 6 for me personally, but I, I could be flexible. I mean, I'm okay with 5.30. It's really just the getting, 5.30 is cool. I, I could, yeah. that's great. 5.30 would work. That's, yeah, that's a, I'd appreciate that. We can do it at 5.30, it would be better then for me as well. Charlie, what about you? Ready? Okay. Next meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie's fine with 5.30. Okay, so we can start that right away in the next meeting if that's okay. Dr. Murphy, that's okay? Yes, that sounds fine. Oh, thank you guys so much. Oh, sure. Okay, sure. good. I don't have to come in on two wheels anymore. Nope, don't do that. I have to stay at work another half hour, Doug. <laughs> I know. I will not do. That will be the problem. <laughs> okay. So that's that's new or old, whatever. And uh, if there's nothing else, so we can make a motion to adjourn and we can we can call it quits for tonight. I move we adjourn. Second. Third. <laughs> All right, just raise your hand if you agree. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Kelly agrees. Does okay. It's unanimous. This meeting has been adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy. Good night. You Good night. too. Good night. Good night.